You are listening to the Cycling Podcast, added to the France in association with Rafa. The fastest closing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Stage 16, today within Nîmes. Well, chaps, it's hot, isn't it? It's hot and sultry in Neem. I was going to say, where are we, Lionel? But I just said, I just said where we are. Well, we're outside a very friendly bar where we recorded our press conference last night. And we've come back here having initially tried to record our podcast outside an Irish bar. Called but your, your people weren't very friendly there, were they, Lionel? Well, they were not very Irish either. But, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I, I must say, I, I got a little bit uh, angry, uh, to say the least, you know, at these... Uh, unfortunately, uh, as you might have experienced as uh, you know, tourists in the south of France, from time to time you come across, and I'm very sorry to say that's quite frequent, uh, on some you know, bartenders or restaurant landlords not very being polite and kind of pushing you uh, away because the, the table is dressed for dining and you're not supposed to be having beer or that sort of a... This is unacceptable, you know. Uh, if that happens to you, just leave the place, and uh, and you'll find there's lots of friendly places as well. And it's unfortunately, you know, having been a bot and a restaurant owner myself, I know that these practices are uh, rife, and sometimes you don't take the visa card or checks or. Just leave the place, you know. Fall with your feet, eh, Francois? <laughs> wow, well, I've never seen Francois so angry about anything. And I'm wondering whether <laughs> it's a combination of factors, the temperature. Francois has been wearing shorts this afternoon <laughs> against his own very strictly enforced <laughs> rules no, I, and I, regulations. I, I, I think I said on the podcast that, uh, that uh, you know, o- over 39, that's that's the limit. When or over 41, I said, is a limit of, over which I, I, you know, it's allowed to wear shorts. So it's my last chance to wear them, actually. Well, maybe we'll talk about it later. Nature, but the weather well, forecast for the end of the week is, we're is terrible. I think we're all wilting, aren't we? The Tour de France was wilting today in the heat. Uh, it was a sprint stage today, very fast finish by Caleb Ewan, the winner. The only thing faster than Caleb, sorry Lionel, but I needed to say that in order to make, that was it's a neat segue into what I'm getting about to say. The only thing faster than Caleb Ewan today was the sale of Stacey Snyder's mugs. Oh, the yeah. second mm. batch of cups went on sale today and they sold out in four minutes. It's been getting shorter and shorter, the, the window of opportunity to buy one of her beautiful uh, cycling podcast mugs, which have been sold at the Giro and the Tour, and will also be sold as well to, to raise money for good causes. On this occasion, the West Lothian Cycle Park, a new cycling facility in central Scotland, and also the David Carey Scholarship Fund, the memory of a young boy in Virginia who was a very keen cyclist and who very sadly died in June this year after a long battle with leukemia. A fund has been set up in his name to to help young kids who wouldn't otherwise be able to cycle, take part in cycling act- activities. So two really good causes and a lot of money raised for them. And it's all thanks to you, listeners. And the response to the Cups has been, well, it's been very gratifying, hasn't it? It's been wonderful to see the enthusiasm to, to buy them and to support the good causes and to own a, a beautiful object as well. Well, the thing is, Richard, you said this earlier but i completely agree with you the, the way stacy has kind of documented the making of the cups and these are beautiful handmade objects they're all you know individual they contain the quirks of being a, an individual unique handmade product and well the only regret is that she can't make enough of them seemingly <laughs> i mean if they sell out in four minutes the demand is uh, is obviously there from the, from you the listeners and uh, well we will hopefully repeat this yeah well. why not why not? why not? There's obviously demand there, and we're sorry for everybody who tried to get one and didn't, and we're very pleased for those who who, who tried and did get a, a cup. Hope you enjoy owning it. On with the stage then, Lionel. It was a, well, a strange stage today, starting and finishing in Nîmes. Am I doing the tail of the attack? No. <laughs> you want Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, Richard. It was a strange day. For us, almost a second rest day in a way, or perhaps a first rest day, because we travelled over from Foix yesterday. So Foix. Our our rest day afternoon. We've been, been saying that a lot today. Was, the heat. was quite uh, truncated. We didn't get a lot of downtime yesterday. But today, with the the stage going out from Nîmes and out into the countryside and back into Nîmes, it gave us an opportunity to have. Well, I had my first lunch in an actual restaurant since Brussels. Um, not eating in the motorway services or 
eating in the press room. That was a real treat after two and a half weeks, I have to say. I had an omelette. So I, I thought this was the tale of the attack, it is. not the tale it of your day. Of <laughs> well, Story of my itself, day. The race itself, I can summarise in a handful of sentences. There were five riders in the break. Lars Back of Dimension Data, Stefan Rossetto of Cofidis, Alexis Gouger of AG2R, Lucas Wisniewski of CCC, and Paul Auzelin of total direct energy they were out in the heat all day they were caught with only two and a half kilometers to go and then came the sprint and it was another impressive finish by Lotto Sudal's Caleb Ewan who wins his second stage of the tour and Lotto's third in all he was ahead of Elia Viviani and Dylan Gronewig and, and Peter Sagan the big news on GC was that Jakob Fulsang lying ninth overall this morning, crashed with around 28 kilometres to go, and he is out of the race, and so everyone shuffles up a place on GC. Tomorrow, a more demanding stage goes from Pont du Gard up to Gap and the gateway to the Alps, as they say. The fastest closing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Thank you very much indeed to our headline sponsor, Rafa. And a reminder, if you want to own a beautiful Peddler de Charme t-shirt or cycling jersey or casket, go to rafa.cc and you'll find the Cycling Podcast range of clothing there. We will be uh, awarding a Peddler de Charme t-shirt again this week at the end of the week. And we'll be looking for nominations of riders deserving of the Peddler de Charme awards. So keep your eyes peeled and send in your nominations to us please uh, Lionel you mentioned Jakob Fulsang out of the race uh, he's not broken anything apparently we saw him being delivered to the, the medical van uh, near the, the press centre where he was scanned and so on and there were scenes there with his his wife uh, waiting outside and, and a couple of TV crews trying to to film what was going on and she was getting extremely angry I mean it was very hot uh, I'm sure tempers were fraying as a result of that but scenes as I say outside the medical truck but I guess yeah. uh, a, a disappointing moment for her and for Jakob Fulsang and uh, not one that she really wanted to be caught on camera of course not, but I can understand the other side of the story as well. Uh, we often see those images, don't we, on TV of a, of a rider entering or exiting the X-ray truck, at, which is normally down at the, near the press room, isn't it? And yeah, but if you're, if you're married to the rider who is going off to be checked, I, I imagine pretty uncomfortable to be followed by TV cameras, but that is the kind of goldfish bowl of the Tour de France, isn't it? And uh, well, it's part of life on the tour. I just realised that we actually even introduced you properly tonight, Francois. Only at the start with the... You, we, you, you haven't said... Oh, well, you said where we were, but uh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that, Francois, because no, you, sp- you spoke to Jakob Fulsang's I teammate did. at the finish. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so, well, actually, when... Obviously, as usual, when a crash happens to a, to a rider, especially a prominent one, there was quite a, quite a crowd of uh, our colleagues around the bus. Uh, not praying on you know on on the casualty but just to to get to know what how a body was and how it happened because uh it happened quickly and we couldn't see it so last michaelson which is u- usually the, the guy we talked to the, the the team director wasn't there because obviously he, he'd been to uh you know hospital or to medical checks with jakob fugelsen so while well, we waited for the for you know for his teammates to come back to the bus i mean the, most of them waited for him and tried to to see what they could do to you know uh, take him out of trouble, but unfortunately, they were told to, you know, go ahead and leave him behind because, uh, you know, they, they obviously uh, realized how bad he was. And uh, so I talked to Pelo Bilbao, who was actually just behind uh, Jakob Fuglzang when the crash took place. Well, this is what he had to say. Seen the crash just in front of me, and uh, three, four riders went straight to the barriers. We were crossing uh, town, narrow roads, and. Uh, also, the asphalt was quite bad. He couldn't do nothing. He went straight to the barrier, and I think he has uh, broken something in the in the hand. A huge blow for the team, obviously. Yeah, a bad day. Uh, if he doesn't move in the in the moment, for sure, he has something serious. And uh, yeah, now uh, important objective that uh, we are not going to achieve finally. We are fighting there. At least to try to maintain top 10 and gain some positions day by day. But uh, now we are going to change uh, objectives. 
obviously. He didn't have uh, any any doubts, or yeah, for sure he has uh, something broken. Peo Bilbao there of Astana, a Basque climber, apparently on his way to Bahrain Merida next year to hook up with uh, Mikel Landa, we believe. Uh, but another crash today was uh, involving Geraint Thomas, the defending champion. I think that was missing from your tail of the attack, Lionel. Yeah, we got, I, mean, I mean, it was a. We, we got your omelette for lunch, but we didn't get Geraint Thomas's <laughs> crash. Well, true. It's significant, <laughs> I guess, that the defending champion has been on the floor three times. But I mean, it was a, as they go, a very, a very light one, wasn't it? It he, was, but it was. I mean, it was a strange one. It looked like he. Uh, they were going around a, a corner on a roundabout with a, a big curb, and it seemed like he pedaled down and, and hit the curb with his pedal. It flipped his bike right around, and and he fell quite heavily and at, at some speed. It looked to me like it would be a crash where he's maybe not picked up a, a bad injury, but the shock of that will be something that he certainly feels tonight. And yeah. in these last days of the tour, the recovery is so important that you know it might just have a small bearing on on how he recovers going into tomorrow's yeah, stage. Yeah, but in the same time, you you have these what, what we call in French the luck of the winner. And uh, well, which which means basically that when you're on, on form and and you, and do, and doing all right, you crash and and you know you, you you don't hurt yourself. Whereas when you're on on the downward sp- spiral, yeah, you, uh, you you crash and you hurt yourself. And it was you know obviously the case with Fuglesang. Two bad crashes. One you know put him out of the race. Uh, you know Astana would be doing so well for the, the whole season. All of a sudden, uh, you know, coming to a kind of crisis, and now you know. Obviously, they'll be going for stage wins. I, I suppose their their main goal now in the, well, may, maybe tomorrow, as early as tomorrow, which is a good stage for them. Uh, whereas you know, Garen Thomas uh, felt a couple of times on the tour, felt on the tour, fell on the tour de Suisse as well, and re- well, reasonably, you know, without any serious co- consequence, which is probably which could be seen as as a good thing, you know. Well, we can't continue without focusing on the stage winner well Ewan. let's hear a little sound from outside the Lotto Sudal bus which I got to just after he crossed the line <laughs> so some sounds there from outside the Lotto Sudal bus there were a lot of um, a lot of guests and VIPs there. they had a couple of sponsor announcements on the rest day so maybe they were people connected with the, the sponsoring companies they'll become Sudal Lotto next year um, but there was champagne bottles being opened and, and lots of cheering for the riders as they re- return they're having a really good Tour de France aren't they and a belting Tour de France that's the third stage win Thomas de Gent won in Saint Etienne um, Ewan's won in Toulouse and again today they've had the polka dot jersey since champagne country on the shoulders of Tim Wellens they've been very prominent in breakaways and the win for Ewan edges him ahead of the other sprinters. He's the first one to notch a second win in this tour. And I think it was quite striking to see the overhead shot with Ewan, not a bike length ahead, but a well ahead of the other three who are all in a line, uh, Viviani, Gronewig and, and Sagan. And so you can say, you know, he's sort of head and shoulders above the rest in, in the final 200 metres, particularly when you consider that he's... M- not got the benefit of a full-on lead-out train. He doesn't really need one. Today, he came through, well, straight through the middle, really, and was certainly the fastest. There was, you know, no dispute about that. It's interesting because in, in the, the other, in his, his previous uh, victory, he took the wheel of uh, Grunwegen and, and, you know, and went uh, clear. This time, uh, I mean, I haven't seen the details of, of the sprint, but it seemed to me that, that it just... It just you know, made a sprint. It, it, it didn't even take anybody's will. Just sprinted to the finish line. It was the fastest, which is even more impressive to win in different fashions. Uh, of course, he looks a little bit. Uh, his style is quite reminiscent of Mark Cavendish's. I mean, even Mark Cavendish himself, uh, you know, paid tribute to uh, to Caleb Ewan and saying our, our, you know, similar in style. They were, you know, like kind of a diminutive, not 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 that powerful, but more more based on velocity than on on strength and power and let's face it I, I, in, in my opinion these two victories you know we, we were waiting we're expecting a lot from Caleb Ewan as you, as well, as, you, as we said uh, you know when he were, when he won in his first stage it, it, his Tour de France debut was kind of delayed I mean he could have uh, started like much earlier but now with these two victories he kind of established himself as probably the man to beat you know 
Well, you mentioned Cavendish, and by a sort of quirk of fate, in 2008, Cavendish won in both Toulouse and Nîmes. He also won in, uh, where was it, Narbonne and Chateau Roux. Well, the tour's not going to those places this year, but um, Ewan, you mentioned his delayed debut in the Tour de France, and if we think back, Richard, to our live event in London back in November or December 2017, Matt White kind of revealed that Caleb Ewan would be going to the Tour to make his debut for Mitchelton Scott in 2018 and then that didn't happen he was he was really kind of left out of the lineup because of the focus on on the GC and that paved the way for Ewan to move to Lotto Sudal so at the finish I spoke to the boss of Lotto Sudal Mark Sargent and then his old boss Matt White of Mitchelton Scott um, just to get their um, thoughts on Ewan's second stage win. Can you explain how you signed Caleb Ewan? Because this time last year he was not riding the Tour de France because Mitchell and Scott left him out of their team. I was quite uh, sure that he would be one of the fastest sprinters for the future. It was a coincidence. I saw him and I told him what I thought about him. And uh, he was triggered also by the team and uh, doing it all for him from there it all came and now he proves that I was right and you've had some big sprinters in the last 10 or 15 years Robbie McEwen Andre Greipel True. can you compare you and to those guys yet well he's uh, he's different if you compare you have to compare with McEwen because he's also very aggressive and uh, looking for the wheels he wants and uh, normally he has them today he lost it I think and he, uh, he made it all by himself up so uh, he started way too early for him but he, man- he managed to get it so, uh, great. He's almost a modern sprinter because he doesn't need a lead-out train of five or no, six guys. Not really, but they were there. They were making the tempo, so he's he can do his, his thing, you know. He wants to do it by himself, not the train. And that's why he's so uh, so good in. Today, he, hadn't, he didn't have the fastest wheel in front of him, so he went for it, and he won. That's, for me, the most important uh, about today. And how about Paris now? Let it come. But we have some hard stages in front of us. Thanks. This time last year, you guys had to make quite a difficult decision with letting Caleb Ewan go, a sprinter of his quality, because he couldn't fit into what you wanted to do. But when yep. you see him win a couple of stages the way he's won them, how do you, how do you feel? What do you think? Oh, I'm super happy for him. He's, but he, he's a great guy and he's worked very, very hard to get where, to get where he has. And there's, no, there's no bad blood there at all. It's, it's a business decision. And you can't do, you can't do both things properly. Lotto Sedal don't do general classification. Their primary focus is around the classics and around Caleb Ewan. So it was a great, great uh, team for him to go to. We go on a different track, GC in all in all three Grand Tours, and also World Tour races in general. Where every World Tour race we go to, we're, we're competitive to, to try to win it. And now with the reduction of team sizes from nine to eight, and sometimes eight to seven in rosters, you know, trying to have a, a sprinter a support crew climbers doing GC either do it properly or if you try to do both things it can backfire but it just shows that if a rider leaves and, and finds a team that can accommodate them you, you start to see the best of them 100% and look at the end of the day Caleb had won everything but a stage in the Tour de France on our team we had developed him since he was 20, 19 years old in our development team right throughout our pro team he'd won in the Walter, he'd won in the Giro so uh, it was the last box for him to tick and congratulations Chute, chute à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack, please. Thank you to Seb PK for reminding us to tell you that this episode of our Tour de France coverage is sponsored by the Watt Bike Atom. We've spoken in previous episodes to Dan Bigham of the Hoop Watt Bike Track Team, and we mentioned how stable the Watt Bike Atom feels. So we wanted to ask Dan what his experiences were and whether the stability of the Watt Bike Atom helped when trying to do efforts at maximum watts. They've gone about looking at how force is applied throughout the bike and where they need to correctly brace that and obviously it has quite a wide platform as well so yeah you're not getting rocking you can do absolute full gas sprints and not not worry at all about that it's i think we did the the what bike 1k challenge it's a facebook live video somewhere and johnny peaked at 2100 on it and barely moved yeah there's not an issue uh, at all at that perspective and just a couple of years ago back when we were on turbos i remember every time we were doing sprints you have to go and shout one of your mates to go and stand on the turbo to make sure you don't rip your bike off or 
fall off or whatever. So yeah, it's absolutely rock steady for that. You cannot fault it one bit. The only frustrating thing about it is therefore it makes it a bit harder to take it around everywhere. So I can't really take it to, to go and warm up and everything else, which would be the dream, I guess, in reality. But every price, I think it's worth it for just having such a solid and stable indoor training tool. So it's perfect for us. And we have one set up in the, in the altitude room as well, which is a bit nerdy for us. But again, it just means you don't have to worry. You don't have to drag bikes in and out of the altitude tent. It's just all set up in there. And because it's so easy to adjust, you've got sliding saddle, fore raft, up, down. Same again with the drop bars and the extensions on there as well. So everyone's positions can be on in, in seconds, which makes life really, really easy for just going in the tent and getting our training done ahead of heading up to Mexico in a few months' time. To be honest, Rich, I can't say that I... Hang on, I know I... I... I could have I could have told you that the what what bike atom is stable when you're putting out two thousand plus watts. We don't we don't need Dan Bigham to tell us that. Oh, I, I dispute this. I dispute this. I want to see your numbers because these numbers sound paranormal, and I don't doubt the watt bike atom. I doubt you. I did feel though, even with my mediocre watts, that you, it didn't wobble. There was no you know it was rock solid, very steady. And the other thing about it is that its footprint, so to speak, is very small. You can push it away into the corner of the room when you're done with it and really takes up very little space whatsoever if you'd like to buy a watt bike atom you can do so at wattbike.com and you have until the end of july to get 100 pounds worth of sigma sport vouchers with every watt bike atom purchased go to wattbike.com slash tcp100 and use the code tcp100 when you check out that's tcp and the number 100 before the break, we heard from Marc Sargent of Lotus Sudal and uh, Matt White of Mitchell and Scott. Caleb Ewan, as Sargent suggested, could now win on the Champs Elysees. He's never finished a Grand Tour. Uh, this is the furthest he's ever been in a Grand Tour. He started four before uh, three Giros, three Giri, and one Vuelta. He's never, never got to the end. And uh, there were some whispers that he may pull out after today's stage, but uh, that would. That would seem silly now, wouldn't it, with this chance opening up of a, a third a third stage win on the on the Champs Elysees, and he must be delighted uh, to to be here and to be in this sort of form because uh, you know to go to a new team uh, it was a really I think it was a really important season for him and for his team because he was stepping into the shoes of Andre Greipel. Those were big shoes to fill and uh, very different riders, aren't they? He's very diminutive, Caleb Ewan, and he's he's a huge gorilla, Andre Greipel. But, you know, for him to have had the season he's had, where he's won stage in the Giro and here, is is fantastic for him and for his team. Absolutely. And you spoke to their, well, their new, new man, new-ish manager. Yeah, and absolutely, uh, John Lelong. And, I, well, that's exactly the question I asked him. Uh, what what next? I mean, you know, uh, that, that there's, a, there's a bumpy stage to gap tomorrow, which could... You know, f- uh, which could be very, uh, very f- well, fine for Thomas de Gen or Tim Wellens to to keep chasing uh, KOM points, and and also uh, Le Lang was seemed to imply that the Calabrian would go all the way to Paris, in spite of r- apparently very, very hot uh, mountain. St- well, we knew the mountain stage in the Alps would be tough, but apparently they're going to be very cold and stormy as well. So uh, could Calabrian su- survive uh, the- this? Alpine ordeal. Uh, well, let let's listen to what John Lelong has to say. We know c- confidence is important for a sprinter. Do you think that now, thanks to these victories, it, it, it can go a level higher? I think that the confidence is there since the beginning of the season. We have seen that uh, we are totally focusing on on those stage wins for him, and that the seven riders which are around him here at the Tour of France are totally focusing on him on all those sprint stages, without exception. And that he, even if uh, he was in uh, in the trouble uh, in the stage two days ago, that we di- we directly stopped all the team to uh, to wait for him because we knew that just after the race day we had more, one more opportunity and, and you saw that the guys like Tish Beno, Tim Wellens, uh, Thomas Zegens, they were taking six guys to bring him back to the peloton and to be sure that he can survive this difficult stage two fois. Finally, three short, probably stormy stages in the Alps. Uh, it'll be a matter of survival now for Caleb. Yeah, no, it will be survival not only for Caleb, I think, for a lot of, of people. But first, let's concentrate tomorrow. We have a nice stage. We have uh, La Sentinelle. We have the Donil to Gap. Maybe an opportunity for breakaways. We'll see. So let's take it uh, stage by stage. Final word on Caleb Ewan before we move on. Uh, I'll refer you back to Adam Blythe's interview with him, which was the first in our Adam Blythe interview series. And it, it was really fascinating to learn about what a versatile rider Caleb Ewan was in his 
youth. You know, he's not just a pure sprinter. That's obviously his his specialism now. But he was a guy who, as a, a junior under the 23 rider, could climb with the best of them. And uh, he had a funny story about the World Championships, I think, in Florence, where the commentator confused him with a Colombian. <laughs> uh, he, he thought that he was a Colombian rider just because he was climbing so well and he's, he is quite diminutive there's quite a lot of Colombians who are similar similar builds so there's more to Caleb Ewan than just the final 200 meters of a race so yeah. you know he's got every every chance I think of making it to Paris and maybe yeah. winning on the Champs-Élysées yeah once again going back to the Cavendish comparison I mean you remember how bad uh, Mark Cavendish felt every time you know his um, climbing abilities were put into question you know he yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. how could we forget um Mark Cavan is racing again today, returned to racing, or is it tomorrow? Um, he's returning to racing this week anyway. Now, we've got an overall battle to concentrate on the next few days. Not, We're not really sure maybe what to expect tomorrow. Um, it's a sort of transition stage setting up two huge stages, three huge stages in the Alps, really. Is it? I've lost track of the days. Tomorrow's Wednesday, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So then Thursday, Friday, Saturday are the big days in the Alps. At the finish today, I spoke to Javier Artecha, the coach at Team Ineos, who looks after Egan Bernal, among others. And I just wanted to get from him a sense of how Bernal is heading into these uh, crucial stages, because a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, have Ineos got it right in terms of having their riders come to the boil at just the right moment in these stages? Everybody knows this is when the tour is going to be decided, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Perhaps Saturday. Perhaps the tour will be decided on the final climb. Anyway, here's Artecha on Bernal. He's still such a young rider, this only his second Grand Tour, but he's in a, a very strong position in, in the final week. How, how is he physically at the moment? Yeah, he's feeling okay now. I think one of his strengths is the recovery. We saw last year as well, the third week, he was uh, doing a really good job for, for the team. And uh, this year, it's uh, is pretty much the same now. He's feeling well, uh, recovery. Rest day yesterday was really good for him. This morning, he looks really, really well. So, uh, yeah, looking for what for the last week. Does he like the heat as well? I don't know. Something is something that we will find now. No, maybe Maybe he didn't race too much with the heat, but he likes both when it's heat and also when it's cold. He likes both extreme conditions because he thinks that uh, it's, uh, the race can be harder. And uh, when you when you feel good, you want a you want a hard race. No, it suits uh, really well to him. Saturday and Sunday, the the mountain stage in the Pyrenees. Was he performing there at the level you you kind of expected from him? Yeah, I think he was uh, he was performing really well. If you see how strong the people was in the race and uh, only the climbing, the power they produced and uh, how fast they went. I think for him, he was uh, performing really well. He had really good numbers. We are hoping to have the same in the third week here in the Alps. I mean, altitude is a factor as well and he comes from Bogota with 2,600 meters. Is that a factor in his favor this week as well? We hope so. I think he, when uh, the race is going up to 2,000 meters, it's going to be a benefit for him because, uh, as you said, he lives at 2,700 meters elevation in uh, Zipaquira in Colombia. Quite a few kilometers this year in the Tour de France above uh, 2,000 meters. So we hope it's going to be a benefit for him and uh, he's going to perform really well at this altitude. Can he win the Tour? Yeah, why not? Who's going to win the Tour? I don't know. I think he's uh, one of the can win and, uh, and G as well. So uh, uh, for us, as long as uh, we have the winner in Team Minios, we are happy. The Cycling Podcast at the 2019 Tour de France is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And uh, you can get your 25% off at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25. A reminder too that Science and Sport are running a fabulous competition to win a day in the Team Ineos team car at either the Vuelta or the Tour of Britain. It's your choice. You will also win £400 spending money, transport and two nights accommodation uh, there are some great runners up prizes as well and uh, to enter the competition all you have to do is go to scienceandsport.com forward slash sign up that's scienceandsport.com forward slash sign up good luck with that now i was mentioning the the stages that we've got coming up lionel a bit more detail on those yeah well 
tomorrow's stage is a very typical stage to gap. We always know what's going to happen in gap. There's a there's always a climb, what, six, seven, eight kilometres from the finish and then a descent down into town. Uh, could be one from the breakaway. Unlikely that the GC riders will uh, be particularly active, n- not least because there aren't any bonus seconds on that final climb tomorrow. The next stage on Thursday to Valois is, is really difficult. It goes over the Col de Var, which is 2,109 metres, the Col d'Isoir, which is 2,360 metres, and the Col du Galibier, 2,642 metres. And there's a time bonus on the top before the descent down into Valois. That's a, that's a real difficult stage. Then on Friday... The stage goes to Teen. It's actually pretty short, 126.5 kilometres. If you look at the profile, it's up all the way to the Col de Lizarin. There's bonus seconds on that climb and then the climb up to Teen at the finish, which is not that difficult, but uh, coming as a summit finish, um, that will certainly, you know, whether we see action on the penultimate climb leading to that, well, we'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see. And then on Saturday... It could, as we've been speculating all day, Rich, it could come down to the final kilometres of Val Thorin. The Before that, we've got the Corme de Roseland, and then the climb to Val Thorin is, an, is a brute. It goes up, really, for the last 35 kilometres of the stage, and the, the last eight or 900 metres are probably not dissimilar to the new bit that they did on La Planche de Belfi in the first week. We were talking this morning to Dave Brailsford about the, you know, what are the tactics here? And when I was talking to him, he was saying the problem here is that Julian Alaphilippe is, is ahead and he's the first nut that has to be cracked. They have to put him to the sword by setting a fast pace somewhere on the, on the climbs. But of course, no one wants to do too much because the, whoever cracks the nut, somebody else may greedily come along and then eat the contents of the nut ahead of them to stretch yeah, that Matt, analogy I spoke to Matt White this morning he um, he predicted that Alaphilippe will have lost over an hour by the time we get to Paris <laughs> he says the, ex- well. the explosion is going to be huge he says it's coming mate yeah. uh, interestingly Alaphilippe uh, apparently didn't go for a ride at all mm. on the rest day and he didn't do any press after the stage today, as is uh, uh, required by the, the, the rider in the yellow jersey. I think they get a day off, don't they? They can make a discretionary well, a- application to the organisers to not do the media that's, that's one right, day. That's right, yeah, the yellow is jersey right? can do that. No, the stage winner uh, has to go, but, but the, if the, the yellow jersey, if he stays in the yellow for, for a long while, I think it's more than 10 days, and maybe, is, is it the case, probably, uh, as, you know, can... The, Say no to one. Well, I didn't. Conference. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, see, so he, he skipped anyway, today. Yeah. Um, it was also interesting. Dave Brailsford uh, really tipped uh, Mikel Landa. He said he's he's the one guy who who has the ability to attack on a climb and sustain it and, and get away. Now we've watched that and thought, well, is he being sort of allowed to get away because he's a bit further back overall? But yeah. according to Brailsford, it's it's you know he has. Uh, he has a, a sort of ability that a lot of riders don't have, and he's still a, an outside threat. This, this this morning, I was talking with other other journalists to Magnus Borgart, you know, the Borahentro uh, German rider, which you know whom we all uh, like very much because he's nice, talkative. I think with Peter de Cham, uh, and and we asked him for his one, you know, top three in Paris, and he said Mikel Landa. I mean, uh, it, it, without any uh, hint of an uh, hesitation. So, yeah, ob- obviously everybody uh, has had the impression that we were always talking about Thibaut Pinot li- losing 140, but Landa also lost, I mean, mm. as we 209. said, but, yeah, 209 yeah. in a crash. And and he was he was one of the one of the guys in the Pyrenees. I mean, the, the there was Thibaut Pinot, obviously the the, the, the most uh, you know most efficient uh, climber in the Pyrenees. But Michael Landa uh, was 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 pretty close in terms of uh, the results. I, I I heard somewhere I can't remember where uh, the list of uh, who performed best on, in the Pyrenees in, in, in terms of time and, and Landa was just behind Pino where obviously Simon Yezzi didn't do so badly because he, he you know won two stages as well so may, maybe Alaphilippe is predicted to be the, the man on the, on the way down and, and Landa the man uh, on, on the way up and uh, another very important factor, I, as I mentioned before, is that I, I had a look at the weather forecast, you know, to know how to dress in the 
since I wore <laughs> shorts today. I'm afraid it's probably going to be the last day when I wear shorts because storms are predicted to, towards the end of the stage tomorrow in Gap. And then the, the, th the three next days, I mean, the, the big days in the mountains look to be absolutely grueling in terms of uh, uh, weather forecasts. Big storms, heavy storms, the temperature going down. And on, on, the, day, on, the, on the crucial day on Val Toras, uh, the, 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 the maximum temperature schedule for the time being is 12 uh, with uh, and, and starting at like 6 uh, uh, in the morning. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to, to go to the, the last stage, or well, the last alpine stage, you know, take your anoraks and, uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, winter gear because it's going to be very, very, very uh, cool and cold, apparently, plus uh, rainy. So this could affect really the, the outcome of the race. Maybe the weather gods are smiling on Thibaut Pinot because we know he doesn't like the extreme heat. He wouldn't want to be climbing in this sort of temperatures, would he, today? Uh, who knows? I mean, what's the possibility of a stage being shortened because of the weather or even... Even ah oh no, let's not speculate. No, but I, I'm but, I'm just but, contemplating the idea of the race the, for the win thirty years after 1989 and the closest finish ever, um, the race for the yellow jersey coming down to the final climb and five riders, six riders maybe, still having a, a shot at winning. I mean, imagine you know, that, we'll, that could happen. We'll, we'll talk about it again and and uh, you know because well, we've got another few days to talk yeah, about it, haven't we? But but you know. The, the, I, I know the, 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 the climb to Val Thorens very well and all this valley going up from Moutier because, I, as, as you know, I, I covered alpine skiing a lot and it's a valley I know well. And the, 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 once again, one, one regret we could have, apart from the fact that we missed Tom Dumoulin and Chris Froome on this Tour de France, is Prius Roglic because what, what, as we go up to Val Thorens, we go it would normally pass Courchevel, and and that's where you have the Olympic, you know, bo uh, board, you know, for uh, ski jumping. So I, I mean, it, it would have been in in familiar terrain by seeing, oh, you know, what's the connection between Primoz Roglic and ski jumping? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Curveball there. Are we do are we doing your feature? Why not? Outside the team bus. Outside the team bus with Nicholas Roach, Team Sunweb. Nico, how was your rest day? Was it restful? Very. I absolutely did nothing. You didn't ride your bike yesterday? Oh, of course, yeah, sorry. But that, that, that's included in doing nothing. Uh, no, we did a, an hour and a half in the morning. Uh, actually, actually, probably a bit less, but an hour and a quarter. Just kind of found a nice coffee place in the centre and then kind of strolled back to the hotel. Uh, in the afternoon was more about, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, as stupid as it sounds, the last couple of weeks were so hectic that your suitcase just kind of slowly but slowly becomes a mess so I just kind of took my time of reorganizing my rain bags and reorganizing the suitcase making sure everything is nicely folded you're not going to need stuff out of your rain bag these next couple of days pretty warm down here are you used to these kind of temperatures are you comfortable yeah I love them yeah I'm, I'm, I don't know if not I mean I've never complained about the heat. That's the, the French half, the Irish half, maybe, uh, used to the rain. You've got it the best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah, although, you know, I think your body does adapt. And uh, as much as I've been living abroad for, I think, almost 20 years now, since I was 15, uh, I think my love for the rain has slowly disappeared. What sort of tour has it been for you? Because if Tom de Moulin had been here, it would be a very, very different race for you guys. Uh, how are you kind of, um, you know, managing that? Because you kind of have a free rain. Do you, does it kind of lack a bit of definition sometimes? No, not at all. Uh, the the team strategy is very, very clear. It's every day we take it as a one-day race and we go for the stage with the better carts. So the strategy is more clear than ever. Uh, obviously, it's a 100% different strategy if Tom was there, but the plan is clear. And the thing is, it's... It's just not an easy plan to stick to, you know, when you go for stages, you, you find yourself fighting against some of the top riders who are also going for stages. And it doesn't mean when you try and win a stage that you're actually going to win one. Um, obviously, it would have been very different with uh, riding in protection of Tom and uh, making sure of keeping him in position, riding for him in the mountains. It's a very different tactic. Now it's all about uh, using everybody's strength in, a, in the best way possible on the particular stage. For example, when there was four of us up the road the other day, while well, Nick Yas and Case sacrificed himself to put me in the best position onto the climb, and then Michael took over on the second part to make sure that we were going to arrive together at the bottom of the last climb. 
most days I've been doing that work for Michael riding in the front till 30k to go there's not nothing is about saving energy for the next day because we're kind of trying to share the load and work as a team towards this goal of trying to win a stage you first rode the tour 10 years ago has it changed much since then can you can you think back to 2009 and, and recognize the differences yes and no because I mean cycling in general uh, has evolved not only the tour so you know I kind of and it doesn't change from one day to the other, so it's kind of progressively changed. I think I've just uh, kind of sunk it in without really paying attention. I mean, 10 years ago, this would have been a skin suit type jersey. The jerseys in 2009 look almost baggy, and the bikes, I guess, have evolved. Does, does that kind of, uh, that technology, I guess, you don't notice because it's always evolving? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's true. That A couple of days ago, for example, I posted a, a throwback photo from 2010 when we did a Tourmalet. And I have the, you know, I have the little speedo on the front with the cable going around the fork. My jersey is a little bit baggy. My sleeves were up to here, much up to, so higher up than they are now. And I remember when the, I think it was Garmin at the time came on the Champs Elysees with the skin suits, and I was like, "What's this about?" And then now everybody's riding a road suit or whatever they name it, but uh, it's very similar. But it's true. I think it was 2011. I think it might have been when the Garmin guys showed up with a with a skin suit on the last day, and I'm saying, "What's this?" You know, it's okay. It's a short stage, but uh, where are you going to put your food? And and to be honest, um, once I've tried the the, the road suit, uh, I fell in love with it because I've kind of broad shoulders, and I just. Uh, felt that uh, without having the bib sharp stripes uh, I was able to breathe better and lastly I mean this tour is so open it's probably the most exciting tour for almost 30 years does it do you notice that or feel that when you're in the race do you do you feel that it's an open race and anything could happen and at the end could you tell me who you think is going to win it's going to take a lot of energy over the next couple of days to get rid of Anna Philippe but I still believe G can make it although I think today the best climber in the peloton is clearly Pinot Oh, Nicholas Rocha, your latest victim, Lionel. Um, the which teams have you still got to do? Uh, you haven't done any us yet, have you? Any us? I haven't done Bora Hansgrohe. I haven't done Jumbo Visma. I haven't done Total Direct. You Energy. have done Jumbo Visma. No, you did I Mike Turnison. No, that wasn't outside the team bus. That was something very similar. Well, to was it? Hang on. Where did the interview take place? Outside the team <laughs> bus. But all interviews take place outside the team bus. <laughs> but there's a very key distinction between doing an interview outside the team bus and doing outside the team bus. Okay. But, but actually, <laughs> taking Nico Roach as a victim to outside the team bus is is is, is a little bit like cheating because <laughs> because every time you don't know to interview go to Nicola Roach because he's, he's nice he talks four or five languages and well <laughs> I wanted to do Wilco Kelderman but he didn't start he's not here that. so <laughs> yeah uh, difficult well difficult well to do so him. you know and it's I tried to do um, somebody at EF Education First it's very difficult to, very difficult to get interviews at EF Education First isn't well, it well it was this Lionel. morning because they arrived late they had to get a police escort into town to oh, get yeah. in, in time they arrived with uh, well, only about an hour to go and uh, that meant that they hadn't had their team meeting and then they had to sign on and uh, so um, I'll try them another day, but that would be ironic, wouldn't it, if I got to got to the end of the race and hadn't managed to have a word with somebody from EF Education first. It would be, yeah. Uh, well, finally, uh, tonight, um, a colleague of ours from the Associated Press, AP, John Lester, tweeted uh, a, a series of tweets this morning about his great-great-grandfather, a really quite incredible story, uh, and a, a link between his great-great-grandfather and today's stage, and I thought I would go and ask him about it today when we met at the press centre. You are a Frenchman and a, an Englishman. A Frenchman and an Englishman, yeah, well put. Tell us this, this story that you posted on, on Twitter today. Well, I'm here at the race covering you know, the Tour de France with the Associated Press, and it so happens that today they went up and down a hill where my great-great-grandfather was cycling back in 1948 from a football match in Alice, which the Tour also went through today, and on his way down the hill he had a, an accident and suffered a fatal head injury. And so we were talking about this last night with uh, you know, Mum and, and other members of our family, and because you know, they were all going out, they were all out there today, basically pretty much where he had this accident. And and uh, Raymond Ducasse uh, actually has a very interesting sort of personal story. He was a French Protestant pastor, which is like a priest, during the war and actually worked to shelter Jews from the Holocaust. So he was providing people with fake identity papers, fake baptism, baptism papers, and saved some Jews from, from you know, possible execution by the Nazis. Afterwards, in 1992, he was recognized by the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem as being amongst the righteous, so basically people who, non-Jews, who during the war had helped Jews in this very dark 
time in their history. And so, yeah, so we ended up talking about this and it just struck me that, the, um, that this is very much a story of the tour because, you know, every day the race goes past some little thing that will mean something to somebody. Um, it strikes me when, you know, we're driving on these roads and you see the little memorials by the side of the road of, of people who've been killed in car accidents or motorbike accidents. And this just today happened to be a story where, uh, a part where it happened to touch my family. So that's why I tweeted what I did. And it also turns out, just to make an even long story longer, that Raymond Ducasse's son, Robert, was in the French resistance and he was executed in 1944, um, while his dad was also, you know, as I said before, um, doing his bit too. And so it turns out that father and son are now both on the uh, Yad Vashem Memorial um, for what they had done during the war. So Robert would be your grandfather's brother? Raymond Ducasse, uh, who died in 1948, he was my great-great-grandfather, my mother's grandfather. Robert Ducasse was my great-uncle. It was nice today because Raymond Ducasse, his only surviving uh, child is now 93, and he, she lives right next to where the race zoomed past today, and her kids came out to the race uh, route, which is at the top of the hill where their great-grandfather was killed, and my mum uh, was down at the bottom of the hill. It kind of had a very personal feel, very personal sort of family sort of feel you know today well the tour does this doesn't it i suppose as you say it, it sort of shines a light on places villages buildings hills uh, and, and puts them in the in the spotlight for a day and, and allows these stories to almost have new life breathe into them yeah, absolutely, because, you know, this is the only sporting event that actually moves around, right? You go to a football match, you're in a football stadium. The tour is going through people's lives, going through people's histories, going through people's towns, their villages, right past their houses every single day. And so basically it's a, it's a sporting event that goes right into your front yard, right into your house, right into your family history. Um, and that makes it so unique. And does it feel quite a special day then to be able to, to tell this this family story again as well and to remember it, I suppose. It has been a special day for me today and, you know, to be honest with you, um, I mean, th this is a story that I've heard many times since growing up and but I never really spent the time to, uh, as I did today, um, to sort of really dig into his family history and I hadn't actually realised personally that he was on this memorial in Jerusalem or Robert either um, and there's, there's, a, there's a very good little swimming spot that the riders actually should have stopped off today which is about a kilometre away from his house um, and uh, when I used to go there as a kid every day to go and swim swim in this horrendous heat I used to walk past Robert's uh, there's a war memorial there with his name on it so he'd always kind of been present today sort of gave me a chance to sort of really dig into this story and I was kind of surprised myself so yeah it has been a very emotional day and I saw you looking up old pictures on, on your computer there you're writing a story as well where can people read the story that'll be uh, on the Associated Press wire and apnews.org which is our website um, and those photos are from my dad who's kind of like a, a history hoarder of our family who's been gathering together loads of photos and it turned out when I sent him a, a message today dad you got any photos of Raymond and uh, Robert and sure enough he's got a whole bunch of them so hopefully they'll be on, on the story as well well as John Lester said a very typical sort of Tour de France story but a, a lovely story and uh a precious day for him and his family, which was nice to hear about. We should wrap things up, shouldn't we, fellas? Head for dinner Head somewhere. for dinner in Nîmes. We had a lovely dinner last night uh, overlooking the amphith amphitheatre in Nîmes uh, with a few colleagues from the press room and roundabout. This evening, I'm quite keen to have something, just something nice and simple, relatively early night before we we move on again for these final few days in the Alps because, well, the tour is all coming down to the last few stages now, isn't it? So we need to be, we need to recharge our batteries a bit. And I feel that Nîmes has allowed us to do that. It's been lovely, yes. You know, bar the odd bit of bad service, it's been a very pleasant, you know, 40 hours or so here. Hasn't it, Francois? Absolutely. Well, yeah, Nîmes is quite a, quite a nice little town. I mean, if you, if you come in the area, I, I you know, Actually, la last night we had, uh, we had dinner in, uh, at, the, at the top of a new museum called Musée de la Romanité. If you're into the Roman era and you like, you know, archaeology and, and, and all these, you know, antiques things, that, I mean, we, we know the Nîmes Arena and all the monuments in the town, but this new museum is ab apparently ab absolutely, uh, you know, gorgeous. And, uh, and I, well, the, the restaurant was quite nice as well. I was just going to mention a theft in the restaurant last night. Um, we, we all ordered our starters and Richard and I had ordered the same starter, uh, buffalo moz mozzarella with uh, some local tomatoes and a little bit of pesto. And well, Richard's eye eyes always dart round the table when the starters arrive and he, he encouraged Francois to steal 
my <laughs> starter. But what was amusing swap was Swap them, just swap them. Swap the starters, yeah. So I had a smaller portion. Um, but what was amusing was that then Hannah Troop, who you may uh, remember co-hosted the Explore series with me last year and is now working for EF Education First. She swooped in to swap her even smaller starter with the one you'd stolen yeah, from me. It backfired horribly, that, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 was, I was left with a very meagre starter indeed totally so, so once again yeah come to the how you come to Nîmes avoid the the, 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 the the restaurants I kind of mentioned there are they're very nice ones and and once again try the Musée de la Romanité it's a great place you you and you're just in between Montpellier which is a great place and Arles which is also a, a brilliant place to to come and visit and and if you're into you know this kind of uh, south southern atmosphere Mediterranean atmosphere and you like you know what we call <laughs> what I call old stones you know this this, this kind of monuments from the past you have a great time one of uh, a listener kind of taunted me saying uh, given the, the 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 stage today we'll be going through vineyards all day can you recommend wines and and he mentioned costière de nîmes which is the, the the wines in the in the area of nîmes we we had actually costière de nîmes rosé last night uh, which was quite good actually but to be honest, if we're talking about red wines, I'd go more for the wines in the Montpellier region, like Pic Saint-Loup uh, or the Minervois, uh, you know, made of Carignan in the in in the, in, the, in going to to Carcassonne, or even uh, you know the red wines near near nearer to Arles. If you go to Arles or saint rémy de provence or this area, try Henri Milan, Henri Milan. That's great ones as well. But of course, in, and if you go for rosé in Nîmes, not far from Nîmes, there's a little village called Tavel, and it's probably the, the most the most famous rosé uh, in the world. So th- 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 there we are. Uh, you know, the, the 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 little wine lesson I was I was supposed to be given, it's it's just been given, and I'm going back to my beer. <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully we'll have a nice bottle of rosé tonight. We're in rosé rosé country and rosé weather, isn't it? it? It sounds like Nîmes is about to kick into party mode uh, a, a band is about to start playing here there were little bandstands around town last night so live music was kind of drifting through the streets very pleasant i, li- I like like this city a lot yeah um before we go i was darting around today on my uh, austin cycles atto folding bike if you want to win one of those sign up for our newsletter at the cyclingpodcast.com uh, and then through the newsletter you can Enter the competition. Tell us why you should win this bike. It's a beautiful carbon fiber folding bike. And uh, we'll read out a few more entries for that tomorrow night, I think. Before we go, some thanks to friends of the podcast and a reminder that you can sign up as a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. The most recent episode was Lunch with Dave Brailsford. There's lots more uh, episodes to come, including uh, audio diaries from the Giro Rosa by Taylor Wiles and Lizzie Banks, who won a stage there. That, they'll, that'll be coming soon, and uh, I think lots of other episodes exclusive to Friends of Podcast coming as well. My thanks to those who've signed up recently. Timothy Main, Nigel Hartle, John Lyons, Jonathan Lewis, Seb Ramsey, Anderson Schneider, and Jenny Craig. Grand merci at Nat Henderson Cox, Michael Quetel, Joe Trickett, Lee Chapman, Jonathan Cutts, Nicholas Russon. And a big thank you to Susan Taylor, Michael Stewart, Adam Nash, Susan Ross, Paul Dinning, and Sarah Raw. Thank you, fellas. Thank you, Richard. See you tomorrow. Well, see you now, but also tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>